was okay we're recording <laughs> great uh here i am this is uh, coalence adventures interview number tw number 11 with leland sklar who was the first interviewee and uh this is the first zoom interview i'm doing so welcome in leland Oh God, I'm so proud to be a, a part of your, your launching your Zooms here. This this is great. It's really fun. I'm happy to be here, my brother. Thanks, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, I I went through like every interview that you've done before. Vicki Abelson, um, all three of them. Uh, Greg Bissonette. Uh, just the recent one, um, Kenny, Kenny Aronoff, Kenny Aronoff, yeah. uh, and Ron Carter. And I tried to glean stuff that you hadn't talked about before, <laughs> but I got tangents from where I can go off of that. So I'm going to start with, and we only have a half an hour. So, uh, I boiled it down to about four or five topics. The first one is going to be COVID, um, starting back on i guess it was march 15th or 16th when everything shut down for you yeah how did it first affect you the first news of it well it, just before that uh the immediate family had done a rock legends cruise and there was some talk like that there was some ships that were being it was down in the caribbean but there was uh we were hearing about ships that were being quarantined in asia in some of the ports there and nobody really knew about covid yet they knew something was going on and when we finished that that cruise about a week later is when the proverbial shit hit the fan about this and all of a sudden i was getting calls because i had a i had a book that was busy for a year and people started calling first saying we're going to postpone it then they said we don't know what's happening so we're just going to cancel and we'll see what happens so it was a very bizarre kind of surreal experience. I, like everybody else, I had never gone through this before where suddenly I was looking at an empty year ahead of me. And uh, and I sat back and, and kind of started thinking about things, you know, what, what can you do to still feel viable? It wasn't so much, can I make a living during this, but I need to do something. And uh, uh, and so I, I started exploring and that's how I ended up doing the YouTube channel and the book and recording at home and, and all, all those things. So, so the, I, 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 I used it as a productive time. Yeah. But it, it's still, I mean, it's, it's one of the big epochs of our life. I mean, yeah. Kennedy assassinations, Martin Luther King, uh, Twin Towers, just all of those things were like, where or the moon landing where were yeah, you their benchmarks yeah and yeah. and then what do you do after and how how is the world different now yeah so, um it, well and also the fact that COVID is still an issue i yeah. mean so many people are acting like it's behind us now and yet i'm still going and doing projects where we're having to COVID test when we get there and and there's people i know where tours are still getting bumped because of you know, somebody's got COVID in the group. And so, yeah, well, I, you can't, year, can't be blasé about this. Yeah, last year, I love it for you. Yeah. It yeah. didn't cancel, but it certainly... It changed, changed the complexion. <laughs> yeah. Um, the channel started out of that, and <clears throat> your first song was Against All Odds. That was number one. I just researched it again. Just yeah. Now. And there's one song out of that tour in australia that you've never played and you said you'd save it till the channel closed i don't think that's going to be operative anymore but against or um take me home take me home yeah yeah well i i don't know if i can do i didn't think i'd be three years later yeah. still posting almost daily on here with like 1350 some videos uh, but i i kind of looked at that as that was how we would close our show and that show is what started the channel. So I figure when I get to the penultimate video and I, I'm saying goodbye to everybody and I've got to call it quits, um, that's the song I'll do for that. So I'm still saving it. Yeah, uh, calling it quits. Yeah, um, <laughs> you, you you don't quit. You're like a shark, man. You just keep on moving forward. Yeah, yeah, biting your ankles. <laughs> you you've, you had that collapse and you're recording that day going through the the hallway on a stretcher 
I mean, pretty fun. sick. Pretty sick. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, man, that's and and you're going out next week. No, I leave. Well, yeah, um, I leave Thursday morning. Yeah. Um, uh, for Cincinnati, and and Friday is our first show with Lyle, and we'll be out for three months. Oh, well, enjoy. Yeah. Uh, merch. Oh. Ta da. Oh God! It's it's oh God! That screen is scaring me behind you. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, who are those guys? Anybody? Everybody loves me by Leland Sklar. <laughs> the the famous book, and I have it uh, bookmarked. Oh, there it is. This lovely woman. Hold it up a little higher. And tip it forward because it's got a little light reflecting on it. Yeah. It was also on the following page in the corner. And she's there again. Oh, God. Yeah. This was with this many pictures. I it became a, a better, better spot for it. <laughs> for the next one. Yeah, I mean, it, it and, and there's so many pictures that I, when we finally finished it and, and proofed it and, and we're, it was done, and I went, where's Yo-Yo Ma? Yeah. You know, where's where's Garth Brooks? Where's Vince Gill? I had pictures of all these people, and I didn't want the book to be just celebrity famous people. So we did this, and you by the time you get to about 6,000 pictures, you're like, kind of, your brain has melted at that point. So then all of a sudden you're going, oh shit, that's already, that's still in there. I found a couple of duplicates in the book. And uh, oh. so not, and, and not necessarily duplicates, but the same person in an, in an, in another shot. And I was going, oh God, you know, that, that could have been, but you know, we'll see down the pike. If I still have 7,000 photos I didn't use. That's enough for an online book at least. So <laughs> yeah. uh, I saw a video today that made me think of the book in a sense it was september 4th 2020 and it was you introducing blue and the book on the last day before you sent it to the presses and very very wow. cool video i haven't seen that one yeah well you recorded it but yeah <laughs> I have to, I have it to... 2020 so wow it's it's been a while who would have thunk the out of covid there were bright shining moments that came out the community that forms the yeah. communities that have formed out of that. There's the, the beards and bases. There's the flat five uh, clubhouse. They're yeah. mentioned in, in the videos a lot. There's your uh, one-on-ones. There's um, the beards and bases two, <laughs> two online page yeah. that started yesterday by Jim, Jim Broughton. Yeah. Um, on youtube so uh i don't know if that's gonna be closed or open but still it's... i'm not i that's up to jim to figure yeah. out i'll have to see what he's up to but I think the hardest part of that whole thing was losing sean vidal yeah he was a pr pretty motivating force in all getting all this stuff going and then tragically passed away so... and there's so much information on the original birds and beards and bases that i'd like to see somehow migrated over to yeah. to because it great information i just went looking through it the other day and it's just like man sean created something mighty yeah yeah and and again it's a tribute to how people come together in tragedy yeah uh because without you doing kind of like the book you started off with kinder flipping you off and you started collecting the pictures and the pictures led eventually with yeah with people uh, saying, you should make a book out of that. Yeah, I um, mean, it's it's amazing how these things take on a life of their own yeah. uh, after a while. But the clubhouse has been probably one of my favorite things out of this entire episode that we've gone through because of that community. When, you know, I, I love when we do the, the live stream and how many internal conversations that people have become friends and and you like you and Gina and Deborah and everybody will be and Toby will be talking about gigs you're going to see yeah. and all this and I'm reading somebody else is talking about their favorite cookies and you know, it's Jason came out and and did the uh, Viper Room and uh, 
troubadour or the uh, uh, whiskey? Yeah. I'm and, just glad you continued that sentence when you said Jason came out. If you would have stopped there, we would have had a whole other discussion going. <laughs> yeah, he'll love that. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's just the clubhouse, you see people's text and you see their their names that they're using and then eventually find out what their real names are and yeah. what they look like. I mean, you, you saw that before we did and the Zoom yeah. started that because you were on the road and couldn't do the clubhouse. And so Boz started doing the, the Zoom. Yeah. And yeah. that is yet another community, a sub-community. And yeah. it's just... Um, it's amazing. Yeah, it, it really it, is. Trying to take me into the the next category is the battery and the pocket. Um, for musicians, having the rhythm section tight um and and you've been in battery with so many great drummers is there a difference between the groove and the pocket for you i mean can you have the groove without the pocket well i think it's that's sort of just semantics at that point i i kind of look, look at all that stuff as really under the same umbrella and 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 the really difficult part for me is putting something that's really almost uh, transparent and cloud-like into words. Uh, when people ask me about groove and pocket and, and, and things like that, it's something I, I feel. It, it's like the, the blood coursing through my veins. And it's really hard to explain the feel of that or you know how you could tell somebody how they can do that. Um, but there's there's just something that's so organic uh, to me about it, and I've been really blessed over my whole career, and even be long before my career officially started with bands that I was in in the '60s here in, in in LA. I've gotten to work with great drummers all this time, and so many times the minute we sit down to play, it's almost as though it's a kind of Vi Vulcan mind meld. You know that this thing just happens and it comes together like that, and it's nonverbal. Uh, it's it's not anything we've discussed in advance. It's just like a, we we suddenly go from all of this to in sync, and uh, and 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 it works. I mean, people can I guess be in sync and it might not feel good, and they're both sucking together. I don't know, but um, but to me, it's 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 a really an organic e experience when you're looking at th things like groove and pocket it's just it's something that just is part of your you know your the, the, the blood and stuff coursing through your body i mean you, you had russ and you had uh jeff Picaro and carlos vega and simon phillips and just bill collins i mean collins. it's like crazy it's just jim like keltner i mean they, the list goes on and on and on sean pelton uh, every time I've, I've, I've been, I pinch myself every day at how fortunate I've been in this business. Well, I don't know if it's all that much fortunate. I mean, fortunate for you, but there's, there's a lot of back work. Uh, oh yeah. Interview where you're talking about being the chameleon and being the idea generator and, and making a cohesive chameleon um, where, where you make you keep things moving forward yeah it's yeah. not a co it's not cohesive as much as cohalen <laughs> yeah if only uh <laughs> which kind of the whole thing about competition versus collaboration mm -hmm. i think in one of the interviews i don't know if it was by greg or maybe uh ron you're you're talking about the difference between the early days uh, musicians and maybe some modern days it seems to be a little bit more of like people talking about the goat, you know, the greatest of all time. And it's, you played with a lot of greatest of all time and it, it's who's, who's the greatest of all time in what, what second, what song, what moment, yeah. you know, it, it's fluctuates and it, there's a love in the community of musicians that just seems to be collaborative. I'll tell you, before we move on from that, thank you so much for this moment, because I, I I'm constantly seeing goat, and I had no idea what goat meant. <laughs> okay, 
Yeah. I just figured they looked at them when they would talk to me and say, oh, that that goat, I would figure they thought I was look like a goat. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for, the, for that. Um, you know, the, the thing that was great back, especially in the beginning of all of our careers together in the 70s, it was this really giving musical community. Uh, people were hanging out together and sharing ideas and thoughts. We'd be in the studio like with James Taylor. And David Crosby and Graham Nash would stop by and they'd say, well, let's do some background vocals and stuff. It was this, this thing that was so organic, where as time went on, sometimes there was less work going on. So people were more protective of their space. So they weren't as sharing as they were. They were, they were became a little bit more insulated. And uh, I, 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 I feel really great that, that I was a part of that community when it was really just everybody was throwing stuff to each other. I would be doing sessions. And if I didn't feel like I was the right guy for it, I would say, oh, call this guy. He's he's the cat for that stuff. And we, we really, there was a lot of, you know, uh, community. Kind of, it, it, it was really kind of like the uh, clubhouse. It, it was really a, a special time. It, it isn't gone, but it, it changed. Like everything changes over the years. Yeah. Well, like the music business changed once the Bronfins and other people started buying up the individual record companies that had a, yeah. a, a purpose for being and, and yeah. sort of got absorbed. And, oh, we'll make one big Warner Brothers thing out of it. Yeah, it became more business oriented where like I, I, in, in the, the early days when you had like the Ahmed Erdogan's and Joe Smith's and all these people running the labels. They knew the lay. They knew they were going to make money, but that wasn't the motivating factor behind it. They wanted to make the best music they could, so they were real involved in like artists that were signed and the albums that were being made. They were they weren't necessarily musically directing them, but they were very supportive and stuff. Where all of a sudden you were finding more lawyers and accountants and stuff getting involved in it, and it became more business oriented. And you were seeing decisions being made that you kind of went really really but it wasn't a musical decision it was more you know they it, music was just a product to them they could have been selling anything from lipstick to cars you know they were just looking at, at you know the sales charts and things like that so it changed dramatically the before that the business side changed there was an evolution in sound recording from like yeah 68 i think they've got the first eight track or four track everything before that was just stereo or mono bouncing bouncing all over yeah and yeah. then you know 32 track 64 track that was i think by the 70s but how did that affect studio musicians like yourself uh, uh, well it, it literally from from my standpoint it had no effect i was just a channel uh, on a console yeah i think it was it made a dramatic difference from the standpoint of engineering, uh, giving the engineer, you know, sometimes too many options where when you, you, you know, you'd see like in an old one, it would be like a stereo mix of like with the drums and stuff. And all of a sudden you had, you know, 16 tracks of just drums. So every drum was mic'd and, you know, so they could, and sometimes I, I think that was far more dangerous. You know, I, I, tr I trusted a, an engineer with great ears, like an Al Schmidt who could just put it, set down a couple of mics and suddenly you're going, Wow. But I always, you know, to me, I always had one or two tracks. I mean, they would either just take me direct or they would, you know, say, well, we'll mic the amp too. And uh, so for me, it really didn't change. But when suddenly you could have like, you know, 60 tracks of a vocal and sit there and comp it all and find every syllable, uh, a lot of times you ended up with perfection and no soul when that happened because they they weren't looking for performance. They were looking for this this accuracy and that so a lot of that changed when the the people sitting making decisions changed now did you start off with the direct box or was it originally just miking the amp um back in the day i think i think some of the early stuff was probably just miking the amp and then because the thing that was strange for me was literally when i went in the studio the very first real professional album i did was with brian highland being produced by Del Shannon. And because I think they saw our show at the Troubadour with James Taylor and they hired me and Russ to do that album. But I had I had only been in the studio once before that to do demos with our group Wolfgang. 
So when I suddenly found myself in the studio, I had no clue what the hell to do in there. You know, what's a direct box? You know, you know, how, miking amps. What are you talking about? I mean, I, I was a club guy, so it was a it was a real education, really fast because we went from zero to suddenly being like almost first call guys in town and uh, with zero experience. So it was pretty bizarre. It was like guerrilla warfare in there. Nice work if you can get it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a perfect storm kind of a period. The sequence, was it Barefoot Servants before Wolfgang or vice versa? Oh, Barefoot Servants was in the 90s. Okay. Later. Yeah, Wolf, Wolfgang was in, started in 1968. Okay. And I think I think we did the first Barefoot Servants album around 92 or 3 somewhere in in there. So, quite quite later. Okay. So, you'd done James already by that time. Oh yeah, and I'd been with James for 30 over 30 years at that point yeah. and done all those albums. I st I stopped working with James in 1990. Uh, when I was when I, when I had already committed to to the but serious tour with Phil Collins and that was going to be a year so and James decided he wanted to work that year and there was no way I could do it so that was when we parted ways my, one of my favorite lines in your reworking of werewolves of London is the uh <laughs> everybody but but Steve has been fired by James Taylor it's so true <laughs> yeah. well we'll have to work on getting Steve fired by him too at some point yeah which goes back <laughs> to the media family yeah this was the first album the one that created it all. Tip it down. There we go. There we go. This is the Japanese recording of Danny Kuchmar and the immediate family. Yeah. Um, it's nice presented, uh, nicely pres presented. Uh, 12 cuts. A lot of it was the stuff that you guys did at that show up there at Bogies 2018, June, I believe. Um, and it was uh, where you were when you used to announce yourselves as a cover band that only did originals. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was so true. Well, the whole thing came about really because I'll give you a, a really quick lineage of it. We, we got asked to do one of those rock and roll fantasy camps in Las Vegas. And it was Russ and Cooch and Waddy and me. And so we went and did it. And we kind of looked at each other afterwards and said, this was really kind of fun, but it didn't go on from that. Then Cooch got offered a record deal with Vivid Records in Japan to do some of to do his material, and because he had material that hadn't been recorded or you know been recorded by James or or Don Henley or different people, and he ended up calling. He didn't think we would be in town, but he ended up calling me and Russ, and we were both in town at the time. He had come to town. Uh, many months before that and and met Steve Postel and they were living near each other and they started hanging out and playing together. So Steve helped Cooch with pre-production on the album. Waddy was still out with Stevie Nicks. We were going to be in for three days at Jackson Brown studio. So we went in for two days without Waddy. And then Waddy came in on the third day and overdubbed on the, some of the previous stuff. And then we continued on. So we finished that album and the label was going to call it Danny Korchmar. And they said, but what, what, what should you want to call it? You know, and he, and he kind of said, well, these guys are like from my immediate family. So that's how it ended up being the immediate family. So that album was Danny Korchmar and the immediate family. Then when we continued on at that point, we decided it was going to be a band. So we just, you know, made it the immediate family. And that's kind of how it evolved. And, and, and Steve got invited into it you know, kind of by chance, just because we were in the studio and he was playing and 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 joined in the pre-production and all that. And it seemed like a, a good fit. So he kind of just got swept up in the uh, in the the tidal wave that it, that we were going through. Well, you were just playing with him at uh, McCabe's. Yeah. And that was a great show. And you were in the back, but you were noticeable. So. Well, the thing that was nice about that is one of the things that we haven't even addressed in the immediate family is like his finger picking ability and his kind of Leo Kotke style of guitar playing. So it was it was nice to spend an evening just doing Steve's songs because uh, like Cooch and I, I mean, Waddy and I, we always say, hey, folk boy, <laughs> you know, because he's because he really does that stuff so well. 
And uh, so it was fun to spend an evening just focusing on Steve's music and his guitar style and, you know, and having that really nice little band, you know, doing his and stuff. Not, I'm actually going to see him tonight at uh, Alba Showroom Charisma. In oh, great. Yeah, so I'll great. say hi to him for you. Yeah. But uh, that's the other album. The yeah. Current one. There we go. Great. Look at how look at how adorable all those old farts are. Yeah. <laughs> and um there was something I was gonna say. Uh oh yeah. On on this one, uh right after this was out, you guys went and performed it pretty much in Japan, right? Yeah. And then you came back and did bogeys. Bogies was the first US. Yeah, I think so. Now I'm just glancing in the corner. It looks like we have eight seconds. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I had three more sections to go. So, um, so why don't we set up another Zoom and do a part two? Okay, we'll do that. Yeah, but thank you for inviting me, and let let's do that. We could even set it up now and and, okay. and okay. do that. We'll be back. Part Wait, two. it says thirty. Stay and stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. I. It says time left, nine minutes and 31 seconds. Oh. I guess the thing I'm seeing is the clock. So let's just forget about that because we're still together. So let's move. Let's keep moving. But I can't find the screen. Where did it go? Oh. Oh. Let me back to meeting. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Okay. Well, let me jump on to. Uh, yeah. Vicki Abelson brought out information about. Uh, your your home in Pasadena, but it was the first home in Pasadena, and you're now in the second one, right? Yeah. So the story was you went to some event, or and the house, the first house was up for sale, and you heard about it from the realtor who was at the event. And you well, got... my wife and I used to come to Pasadena uh, because her aunt and uncle lived lived here, and we would meet her aunt at a Japanese restaurant that no longer exists here. And we were meeting her, and we were looking around the valley for a house at that point. And out in Van Nuys and Sherman Oaks and stuff. And we met uh, her aunt for, for lunch and this friend of her aunt's uh, swung by who was a realtor. And we started talking to her and she said, well, a house just came on the market today out here, if you would consider Pasadena. And uh, she said, it's a divorce case. They, they, they're looking for, you know, they want to get rid of it and move on with their lives and stuff. And we went and looked at this house and it was so much different and so much more than the valley afforded us because at that point especially pasadena everybody thought that was the end of the universe so yeah. things were pretty cheap out here so we we ended up buying that house in 1973 and then found the house that we're in which we had seen many times because it's uh near the rose bowl and we would go to the rose bowl flea markets and we had seen this house and I, when my wife found this house was available through a girlfriend of hers who was a realtor, I was on tour. The and current. when I came off the road, with I was probably out with James at that point. And as soon as I, I got off the road, I came. we came straight to this house and I had to start talking to the people about buying the house. And it was freaking me out because it was a lot more than I would ever thought I was going to get into. So, But, you know, it's just every day is an adventure. So... Uh she had sort of found the house and said, you got to come, you got to come, you got to buy it. She found the house and said, I want it. Okay. <laughs> like, like the first one, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, you know, in, in, in a good marriage, all you just say yes. Okay. You know, it saved you, a lot of aggravation. <laughs> mentioned kitsch. And I've, I've seen the inside of your house. I haven't yeah. seen the basement, which is probably a safe thing. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's like a it's, museum. And that's from years of collecting, both of you or primarily you? Both of us. And I, I always kind of, I, t I tell people, I said, we're like an episode of Hoarders, but with cool stuff. <laughs> it's, Definitely. Yeah, you know, we've, been, we've been collecting. I mean, we've been together for 50, going on 53 years. And, uh, and since the very beginning, we've just been out scrounging at flea markets and garage sales and stuff. So there's a lot of crap. Stove in the kitchen is pretty outstanding, and the <laughs> the memorabilia from um, Seas Candies. Yeah, well, her mom, my wife's mom, was a Seas lady, so yeah. <laughs> when they were like dumping stuff from a store, 
it was supposed to just go in the dumpster, but instead it went in her car and then she would bring it over. And, and now into the museum. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, switching now to the bases, so I can fit this in, hopefully. Uh, you have six, at least, profoundly recognizable bases. There's the Double Eagle that's now in Florida. Hard yeah, it's at the, at the Hard Rock Hotel in Tampa. Tampa, okay. And then Peace Love, which you still have. Yep. Um, Frankenstein, which you still have, which is probably right behind you, uh, maybe. That's uh, the prototype that you, that Fender's oh, trying to build. Okay. The, yeah. The pseudo Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, the Warwick Wombat, I call it the Wombat with yeah. the producer switch. Yeah. Uh, Resist Bass and Goldie. Yeah. Are there any other bases that are somewhat legendary to you or that? that are go-tos that you still have or used to have? Um, no, I think pretty much what, what you've described there is, is really been the, my main instruments um, because like the Peace Love bass, it was my bass back in the late 60s. So, I mean, that's been with me forever and that's the bass I used on, you know, S Spectrum. I used it on Doctor My Eyes and, and the, all the early stuff. And then when we built Frankenstein, that kind of took that place. Uh, and those were really, uh, Frankenstein was really my go-to bass for decades. It really wasn't until I, I met up with Sheldon Dingwall. And uh, I did, I had some stuff from, from Yamaha over the years. Um, and, and, and they made really nice instruments too. I've, I've got a, a bass that they tried to duplicate of Frankenstein. And it's covered with autographs also. Um, but I think what you mentioned is pretty much my, my go-to rigs when I need it. No, I first saw Resist in 2018 at the Bogey Show. Had mm -hmm. you used that before? But how? When was the period between Frankenstein and Resist? Well, I mean, I've been with Dingwall for probably about 20 years now, and and Resist probably was about six, 15 years ago or something like that. So, I mean, it would have been decades between them. Uh, I didn't pl use a five string for 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 years. So I would like detune the uh, Frankenstein. You know, I, I had the hip shot on it, so I could drop the E to a D. But uh, at a certain point, I was so much of my work was replacing synth bass. I really needed to find a five string that that could accurately create low tones. And the first one I ever heard like that was Dingwall, and I was sold immediately. And that has become my road bass because if there's one one song in the show that needs a five string, I'll just play five for the whole show. I don't change. I want to leave the the front of house guy with the, the least amount of stuff to do with me now so they don't have to have multiple channels and EQ changes. So I just play one bass for the whole show and I just change hand positions based on the song's needs if it's really mellow or bright and things like that. Very cool. And Goldie, I saw you at 2020 NAM with Judith Owen. That was yeah. the first time using that. That was without the hip shot, right? Because that was just off the rack. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, uh, she, she said they asked her to perform there, and I didn't have a bass, so, so I ran down to to Dingwall's booth, and I said, "Can I borrow a bass?" And I just grabbed that one and went up and did it, and and I went, "This is really nice." <laughs> That was still great. And fun. that was the first one, I think, with three pickups that I had used. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So, so I, is that one a three pickup or? I can't remember now. You know, brain starts to disappear. On okay, we're going to um, auction that off, sign it and auction off for the elephant uh, sanctuary, sanctuary. Yeah, in Tennessee. But then you decided to keep, they gave you another one to auction off. Uh, well, they gave me an exact duplicate of it. Yeah. And, and then uh, you put the, the hip shot on it? Well, no, all of my signature bases come with a hip shot. So this was a signature? Uh, yeah. From... yeah. Yeah. As soon as we did that, it became a signature one. Uh, we did a few refinements, and then they put the hip shot on, and and that's on. And then they did the Mando frets and all that on, on all my signature ones with mandolin frets. Okay. But, I mean, for the NAM show, when you first pick I can't up... Rem I can't remember if that one had it or not. I mean, it was like such a spontaneous moment to grab this this instrument. And I, it may have even been like a signature one that they, they had sitting there. Um, and I just, I just grabbed it. But I really hadn't thought about it. But it's just... 
they're all great. I mean, he builds beautiful instruments. And as soon as I played it, I just, I dug it. You know, I just went, this is good. So. Okay. Well, seeing as we're now officially. Less than out, a minute. Less than uh, a minute. Thank you so much, Leland. And uh, we'll do this again. And the road trip videos are so cool. Uh, you Just so much information. So I'm looking forward to those. Oh, uh, they'll be out every day. Okay. Okay, Rick. Well, thanks for inviting me and let's get together again. Okay. And get thee to a concert. Much love, everybody. Take care. Okay. Bye. Great.